What's up, everybody? This is Double G on the Fight Game Podcast Post Crown Jewel Edition. We don't usually do this, but there was an opportunity after this show to go live, and I decided to bring some friends here. We have Brian Zillum on the bottom of the screen for those of you watching on video. Brian does some stuff for the Pro Wrestling Torch. Brian, what's up? Thanks for having me, first and foremost, Garrett. It's nice to actually interact with you and uh, Paul. Uh, Paul and I have actually had interactions here and there on Twitter, so it's glad to... Uh, I'm very happy for this opportunity, and uh, shout out to... Um, I know Denise normally does these post shows, and hopefully we can do our best to fill her shoes. Exactly, exactly. She Her absence is why we can do this. And of course, <laughs> Paul Fontaine writes for the website, also does a couple podcasts for the Fight Game media network paul what's up man oh not much just uh excited i i rarely watch these shows live so it was fun interacting with people during the show and looking forward to breaking it down with you too yeah i'm i'm in the same boat as you i would not have watched it live if we weren't going to do this show and uh, it w i'm glad i did because there were moments where i was like okay this is monday night raw uh and then there were others like in that main event where i was like okay this is what WWE does really, really well. And, and that main event, we'll talk about that main event uh, in a second here. But uh, ultimately, just give me a quick, you know, for the for the folks watching, give me a quick uh, thumbs up or thumbs down overall for you guys, for the experience of watching this show live. Uh, I'll, I'll, Paul, do you want to oh, go, go for it? Go, Brian. Go, Brian. Okay. Go ahead. Um, well, I actually just sent out this tweet. Uh, Garrett, it's funny that you said there was moments of Raw and then some essence of good WWE at times. I pretty much thought this was the skippable Rampage. Like, <laughs> it was... I mean, it, and honestly, though, if you look at everything bit by bit, I everything was like... There wasn't anything... Well, there was a couple things I wasn't like a fan of, but there wasn't anything egregious. The work pretty much throughout the show was steady. There was one surprise that I was completely shocked by, which I'm sure we'll get to eventually. But there wasn't really anything. If you missed the show, I don't think it was going to ruin your experience from Monday night or even, you know, come Friday. There wasn't really anything seismic that was going to affect the, the viewer's experience overall. And I, I know these shows have been better of late. I, I think some people had high expectations, but I, I was... Nothing really bothered me, but that's why I think a nice, if I had to give a letter grade, a fine C for me. Okay, so uh, thumbs down, I mean, closer to thumbs down than thumbs up for sure for you. What about you, Paul? Yeah. I think I liked it more than Brian did. Um, and now what I would say is, and I made this comment, I can't remember if I tweeted it or if I just texted somebody, but for me, it was it was like a, like a up until the semi-main event, it was like a, a raw match with a, a raw show without the commercials during the matches. So like the matches were better than they would be on raw because we didn't have commercials, but it, there was nothing special. Like you could have, but the, the, uh, the women's title match and the main event were both felt were the only two matches that felt like pay-per-view matches. And the Bray Wyatt thing was nothing. We would have <laughs> back then. We'll, we'll so, get to that. Yeah. We'll definitely um, get to yeah, that. Yeah. But, but I, I, I liked it. And I would say like, you know, I don't B minus, which I guess isn't much better than C, but it sounds better. <laughs> so if, if I was to piecemeal this, I would say I really liked the Usos in the Brawling Brutes match. I thought there was creativity in that, but it is also a SmackDown match, right? Like there wasn't too much difference there. I didn't like Bianca and Bailey as much because I don't like that stipulation. I thought the finish of the baby face having to trick the heel into staying down i don't like that just knock her out the power bomb was great let's go let's move on that was the great finish they didn't do that but the main event was exceptional for the kind of storytelling that wwe is good at um you could have seen this match at wrestlemania maybe it's not against roman but this style of match and the bigness of it they really tried hard and uh, and i appreciated that and look logan, logan paul is he is much better than anybody would have ever thought at this uh, age, at this uh, young age of his. So we're going to talk about Logan in, in a second here. Um, main event, we'll just go over the main event really quickly. We'll kind of break it down based on what I think the, the importance of the show is here. Uh, Roman Reigns beat Logan Paul in the main event after a Superman punch and a spear in a match 
that was pretty 50-50, maybe even a little bit leaning towards Logan when it came to the offense. Lots of dramatic run-ins and interference. Jake Paul came out at some point to knock the Usos out with uh, not really good working punches, and, and Jake <laughs> Paul can actually throw a punch, so that was kind of funny. Uh, and then Sola Sokoa came out. Uh, Logan did this amazing dive over the top rope to the outside to take out the Usos, but his undoing was that that he had to save his brother because when he went right back in the ring, that led to the finishing sequence. Roman Reigns is still the champion, like everybody thought, uh, and, and the match was fine. I didn't need to see a title change here. I don't need to see a title change in this match until they figure out where they're going. So um, I thought they played the, the, the big parts of the matchup very well, and I thought that just the the drama and sort of the, you know, bringing out Jake the way that they did, uh, I thought that was really good as well. So let's start out with my first question. You know, my first big point of uh, of this show. How good is Logan Paul and how good can he be? Now, Brian, it doesn't seem like you were as impressed with this match as, as Paul and I were. So I'll let you go first. But for a guy who's had... Are, what are we at? Three matches here? Is is that where his experience level? And goes toe to toe with Roman. Now Roman's the perfect guy for him to work with because Roman is awesome. Uh, so you know it's not like he's had to wrestle uh, Omos or uh, or anybody like that. But at this point in the game, are you impressed with him? And then do you see a future for for Logan Paul here? I feel like you have to acknowledge he's putting in the work because. I would say like the first five, six minutes, I was like, okay, this is fine. You know, it's going 50, 50, but then Logan does things and he just, I, I, I did not expect Logan Paul to bust out a buckshot lariat in this match. I was like, okay, all right. You've got, <laughs> you've got my attention now, Logan. Now, I mean, the selfie thing with the, on the table spot, that was, you know, unique and creative. I feel like, I'm not going to really believe him as a, you know, a primetime player until he realizes all everything he does is a heel. Like I know he wants to be a baby face. He wants to be a baby face so bad, but things like you, you look at his mannerisms in the ring, he deploys and shows he would be a fantastic heel, but he doesn't want to be a heel. I don't even know. Like I presume Logan was the quote unquote baby face, but based on the reactions, Roman was the baby face in this match. So until he really realizes, you know, Hey, I'm getting booed. I just need to embrace this. Then, you know, potentially maybe he's a guy that he could go against go through. Like who knows? Like, you know, I don't know what his ceiling is. I don't know if he's interested in being a weekly character on television. I don't know, but if he's going to be a guy that they can just throw on these shows, which I think ultimately that's what they were testing. I think, you have to acknowledge it, it, he passed everything. Now, is he for me, per se? No, not really. I'm not really a big fan of him and his brother personally, but that's just me. Um, but you can't deny his athleticism at all because he's putting in the work. So there's a comment, uh, and, and I want to bring this up because, folks, if you if you want to drop a comment and, you know, to, to add to the conversation, I'll definitely throw it up. We'll, we'll, we'll talk. doesn't do much for the, the audio listeners who are listening to this after we go live here, but uh, but Pat said Logan Paul hit a better buckshot lariat than CM Punk, and and and, and it's kind of in vogue to to uh, diss CM Punk at this point. But I thought that was funny because the 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 thing. Okay, so the key here to me for this match, Logan Paul can do this match because he doesn't wrestle often. This was a create a wrestler match. He just did everybody's moves that he's been practicing. It's, let, let's save the, the praise on the Sweet Chin music, though. That was a terrible <laughs> attempt at a Sweet Chin music. But he did the blockbuster. He did the buckshot lariat. He did tons of dives. He showed off his athleticism. To me, that was a baby face. The problem is, is that Roman is just such a, a star at a different level in his presence and his charisma. I thought Logan did a good enough job, though, to try and raise his game to, to, you know, Roman's going to overwhelm just about everybody on that stage. So I didn't see him as a heel. I saw him as a babyface wrestler, but when he does the promos and when he comes out, like, you know, with the limo and the sunglasses, that is a little bit more about what you're getting at, where he does seem like a heel in that way. Um, Paul, 
give me give me your thoughts on him. I, I I'm going to guess that you think pretty highly of him because you know I think you you you've been following this this rise of sort of Logan Paul in WWE. But uh, yeah, give me your take on Paul and what you think he can be. I think if he if he was to give them a year, um, you know, they could potentially make him the world champ. I mean, you know, I think he could have those kind of matches and he's, he's got enough natural ability and he works hard enough that, that he could be, um, I, you, you, um, I, when you were talking there about, about what he does, it, what it is, it actually reminds me of Shane McMahon when he used to do <laughs> occasional matches. I mean, he's a lot better than Shane, yes. but it's the same more kind of coordinated. Thing. <laughs> yeah. But it's, you know, like he would do these things because he doesn't have to wrestle every night or every week. Um, but it was like maybe mixed in with a little bit of Shawn Michaels, you know, and obviously Shawn trained him for this match, but the kind of heel that wrestles like a baby face that Shawn Michaels was when he was a heel. So everything out of the ring was heel. But as soon as he started wrestling, like it's, it's almost impossible not to cheer him because like even this crowd, they didn't like him, but there were certain spots where they cheered because like, it's just, it's hard not to cheer him. Um, but I mean, for three matches in, like he's incredible, um, you know, and, and I don't know how long he's going to get. I saw somebody make the, it might've been our, our friend, uh, baby Huey uh -huh. who said that the Usos against the Paul brothers would be a money match. Now, I don't know. I, I didn't see anything from Jake Paul that made me think he no. could do this like, <laughs> no. like Logan, but no. you know, like, you know, all they got to do is set up a few spots and he can do 90% of the work. So. Um, I'd be in for that. No, that that's a great point as far as like what would be next for him. Um, I, okay, so Paul, you said something that I was sort of thinking about in the back of my mind too, which is, could he go? Could he become a weekly day in and day out WWE superstar to where you're pushing him that far for a time? You know, maybe in the future he actually wins this match instead of loses. But I also wonder because it like I think. When in terms of getting over and staying over, not overexposing yourself is very helpful in that. But if he's there every week, can he sustain this? I'm going to guess no, at least right now. But in the future, as he gets better at this stuff, could he be a week in and week out wrestling star? I'm not sure if that's best for his business, but for WWE's business, I do wonder. Uh, what do you think about that? I, well, I, I think it's the same thing happened with Shane, you know, like when we saw more of him, that's when he started to lose effectiveness. But when he disappeared for a while and then came back, it was the same thing. Now, again, he's better than Shane, but, you know, uh, maybe not a full time every day, every week thing. But, you know, if we got him a couple times a month or, you know, just on the pay-per-views and maybe one or two shows to build up to it, I think I think he could maintain that. No problem. <laughs> we had a comment uh, Logan Paul versus John Cena at WrestleMania. Not a terrible idea, by the way. <laughs> Not at Not all. A terrible idea. Uh, okay, so uh, what 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 would you do with him next? I guess uh, the next big show is Survivor Series. I don't imagine that they bring him back that quickly, but may, you know maybe they maybe they do, or do they wait until something like WrestleMania to to build him up for something? Uh, I don't know if it's John Cena, but or could be something like what like what Baby Huey said, the Usos against the Paul brothers, which is a WrestleMania type match, uh, depending on where, where Jake could actually get to in the ring. I've got an idea. It sounds kind of crazy thinking about it now. Seth Rollins at WrestleMania. I mean, if you want to get a good match out of the guy, that's another one, right? If he's only working with really good wrestlers, that would be a, a good one for him, I think, as well. Uh, is it? Yeah, and Seth could Seth could make it to where I don't know if he could turn Logan necessarily, but he no. would do his best. Yeah, I, I'd put him in the Royal Rumble for sure. If if uh, you know, and then that could lead to whatever they're going to do with him at WrestleMania. All right, so let's talk about. What is next for Paul, your tribal chief here, Roman <laughs> Reigns? Where do we go from here? They were teasing war games at, uh, on the commercial a couple of different times. That doesn't mean Roman necessarily has to be in that match. I mean, we don't really know. Like Triple H said, oh, you know, we're not going to do this hell in the cell pay-per-view anymore because we want a natural build. And yet we're shoveling Survivor <laughs> Series uh, war games into Survivor Series. which kind of feels like the same thing to me. But 
what, what do you want to see with uh, with Roman next, Paul? Um, based on the booking of this show, um, probably Lashley for the next title challenger. But maybe, like, I, I think a, a War Games match between the Usos and uh, Brawling Brutes, maybe with Drew McIntyre added to that side, would be would be a you know a, a Survivor Series quality War Games match. It would also um, be a way for Roman to not beat Drew for the title again. Correct. Yeah. And maybe you even build up a, a challenger out of that, you know? Um, but, but I do think like Lashley beating Brock or well, he lost to Brock. Yeah. But I mean, he kind of kicked his ass. So I, I think we're going to get a like, well, we'll talk about that later, but um, actually they tend to give guys title shots after they lose big singles matches <laughs> in WWE. Yeah. Um, but the, the, yeah. The, you're right though. The entire yeah. broadcast was about saying how Lashley kicked his ass and Brock yeah. kind of sneak snuck out a win there. Yeah, so like coming out of that match, I'm thinking, oh, Lashley's the next challenger, even though they get Brock the win. Um, but yeah, so or either that or maybe like a returning Randy Orton, you know, like and, and he probably isn't going to defend the title until Royal Rumble would be my guess. Um, you know, although I, Michael Cole in the main event said he's defended the title at least once a month over the last couple of years. No way. <laughs> I, mean, I have to go back and check that. But no, that was the biggest lie he told tonight. What about house shows? Or is he defending well, it on house shows? Maybe. Maybe. That's yeah. why I said I have to check. Yeah. All right, Brian, what do you think? Where, where should Roman go from here? I was going to say, it, it's funny that you brought up War Games, Gary, because from a storyboard perspective, really the only feud right now that makes sense for War Games is really OC and Judgment Day. That's really the only one that makes sense to me. And I don't think, and you know, Hunter's already went on the vine and said he's doing two. Like, yeah, I don't hate the idea of judgment day and Rhea versus OC and uh, Raquel, because I feel like that's the only feud and storyline that makes sense where, okay, this, like they need to, um, OC needs to get uh, a heavy to counteract Rhea. Let's put everybody in a cage and, and like let's really duke this out. And then you could probably spin off the Finn and um, AJ after that. I presume, as far as what they're doing for war games, something they could do to build off, uh, I guess, like Sami Zayn. I think they're doing the Uso, the uh, the Usos solo and Sami in the um, chamber, so that way Sami can take an L and. If you're going to just throw people together, I think you just do the Brawling Brutes and Rey Mysterio. I just, just to throw something in there because right now, if we're cobbling everything together, nothing has to make sense anyway. So just put Ray in there. I'm sure he could do some great spots with Sammy. It'd be really fun. Ray, I'm sure, would do at almost 50 years old, jump off the top of the pod. That'd be really fun. Um, as far as just Roman, uh, like, I think I'm okay with him just hanging out, not doing anything. I don't think he needs to be really a main saying like character right now. I know they're, they would obviously like him for survivor series, but it seems like everything is going to continue. Bobby and Brock. Well, I'm sure we'll talk about that maybe, but I, yeah, just, we'll, we'll, I we'll get there. Gonna, yeah. They're, they're going to still continue cross and drew. I think that's still going to continue, which can't wait for that. I don't really know what else. <laughs> I just, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not a carrying cross guy. I just, I'm, I'm not. Um, I'm trying to think of anybody else on the roster that you could put them against. I, there's not really like a, a meaningless, like harmless feud that you can give him because like, are you going to just feed him like a madcap Moss or something like that? Cause you look through the SmackDown roster. What is it? And I know Garrett, you asked me what's next. And I would say, I don't know. And I'm, 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 I'm okay with him. Just not, if they don't really have anything of substance, let them just hang out and be on the island of relevancy. Okay, so the giant elephant in the building tonight, or I guess tonight for them uh, in Saudi Arabia, no Sami Zayn. They were chanting for him. I forget which, if it was Jay or Jimmy who kept you know talking about the Usi thing. What I mean, it's I don't know where that thing ends or where that develops, but. If we don't have a contender for, for Roman, there could be a match with him and Sammy against somebody, whatever they, they can create that. And that could, because that storyline, that stuff that the fans are going to eat up, they want to see Sammy in, in big programs. Like he's deserved, you know, he's deserved to be there. 
So I could see something with Roman and Sammy and, it, and it's not a title shot. And it kind of leads to whatever the next storyline piece of uh, of the of the, you know, wherever they're going. Who knows? Who knows where they're going? But I could see I could see that as well. Um, OK, so let's actually go through some of this card. Let's go back to the beginning. And it was Brock Lesnar against Bobby Lashley. Uh, did anybody not think the match was going exactly as it did? It was the, you know, quick, powerful spear, Brock selling a leg, uh, F5, spear, F5. Um, and, 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 then Brock, and then Brock wins with the, a, a, I would say a poor version of the Bret Hart, Roddy Piper, WrestleMania oh, yeah. 7. Uh, yeah. I don't know what was that. Like, it was kind of weird because. So what happens is is, is uh, Bobby Lashley finally gets him in the hurt lock, and he's got it, he's got it, he's got it, probably for a little bit too long. I, I'm I'm guessing that Bobby Lashley's arms got tired, and Brock is just telling the ref to shut up. Like I'm not tapping out. His his arm goes down twice. He goes over to grab the ropes, and then he grabs the ropes. <laughs> for some reason, Bobby Lashley kept the hold on. And so then Brock runs up the turnbuckles, kicks himself backwards, and then pins Lashley. But it was funky from there. Like Lashley was kind of breaking the hold, then he wasn't, and it was so it was weird. Not 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 a great finish. But I mean, wasn't that was that the match that everybody expected? It was absolutely the match that I expected. Or Paul, did you think it was uh, better or worse than than what you expected? Better or worse? No. I mean, you know, it was about what I expected in terms of quality. It, it didn't go exactly as I thought it would. I figured it would be a little more even. Um, and I thought Brock did a really good job selling his leg. Like, I thought Michael Cole could have done a better job explaining some of the moves and why they weren't working as well because of the leg. Like, he even at one point said, oh, he might not be able to do the F5 if, you know, because of the knee. But what he was doing, he was doing the suplexes and he did the F5, but you could tell they didn't have the impact that they would have had if his leg wasn't hurt. And I think that's the story that Michael Cole needed to tell and he didn't really do it. So I think that's why it lost a little to the viewers. Um, and then I had to rewind and look back at, at that finish because I couldn't figure out exactly why Lashley couldn't just roll his shoulder up, um, <laughs> you know, during that, that thing. And and there's no reason. Um, so yeah, the finish was was pretty bad and took it down a bit for me. Um, and, and I think clearly we're probably heading to like a rubber match between these two and maybe a last man standing. Please. Match. Oh, do not utter the word. <laughs> I'm telling you that's Never where it's going. Like, I don't, not that I want to see it, but Dear God. It's, the, it's the logical <laughs> conclusion to what they did. All right, Brian, what'd you think about this match? I'm going to shock you both. I thought almost in Braun was better than Brock and Lashley. Wow. Just, that's a hot take. I I didn't like, you know, Bobby started off the match beating the hell out of Brock. I will say Brock sold did a fantastic job selling, but I was so underwhelmed with this because you know, Bobby is they been pushing Bobby as this like baby face and now I guess after the after the bell, Bobby attacks Brock before the match, after the match, and we're leading to more matches and then now Bobby Lashley is your heel. Like that's your best thing to come out of this. And I had like, I had such high expectations, especially they were starting with this. And I think I, I wrote down in my notes, I think from start to finish, this only went like six minutes and 50 seconds or something like that. It was, and that's what I was saying from, you look at that. Okay. So I want to explain my almost and Braun here. My expectations were Braun and almost were so little <laughs> and <laughs> Almost had his best match in his WWE career with Braun Strowman. Like, I don't know what the timestamp was, but I was really impressed because I was the best I've seen almost move. Nobody. Well, now almost did almost die on that clothesline. I was really worried. I was like, <laughs> dear God. But other than that, that, ex that blew away my expectations. And then you have high expectations because like you go back to the brawls from raw that they had. And those were like high intensity and everything like that. Now, is it possible they're trying to hold that off? Maybe, but I felt like even at something so short, there was more meat on there. And then if they were going to pick a heel, I know everybody loves Cowboy Brock, but I mean, I would rather have a face Lashley because I know Paul mentioned as a title contender, you always get them as you lose. But I just felt like if you were going to have like a B-level player for 
uh, Roman eventually. I mean, Bobby Lashley was not a bad candidate, but now Bobby's heel, I guess. Sure. Uh, so, yeah, I, I'm very surprised at that take. Like you said, he, <laughs> I, I didn't see the the almost uh, almost match uh, as better, but this was exactly what I expected. No stalling. Let's hit all of our moves. Let's explode. Let's start the crowd off hot, and then let let's uh, let Brock uh, go home a little earlier than everybody else. Um, I, I do wonder where Brock Lesnar goes though. At this point, what, what is there left for him to do uh, other than put people over? And I don't think that they're at that point with him, right? Like you could see, you know, Cody beating Brock to cement his status as a number one contender would be awesome. But I don't sense that Brock is just going to be this gatekeeper guy. He's still, uh, you know, at least, well, you know, there has been a change, you know, no more Vince McMahon. Triple H may have different ideas, but I don't imagine that Triple H is going to change who Brock Lesnar is. It just makes him a little bit harder to book. Like you don't want to see him against Gunther unless Gunther is winning. Uh, you don't want to see him. I mean, he could, he, you know, he could face someone like Sheamus and beat Sheamus. And I think that would be an interesting match because these guys hit each other really hard. But yeah, like, do you have, do you have any thoughts on Paul on, on what Brock could do next? That hasn't already been done a thousand times. Well, when you said, where does Brock go next? My immediate thought was the farm in Saskatchewan, <laughs> um, which is which is probably the answer. Um, but, uh, you know, in terms of on screen, I, I mean, I, I already said, I think, you know, we're going to get a rubber match with Lashley. Um, but, you know, other than that, yeah, I mean, they could just, you know, it's like, in, you know, behind glass, break glass and, you know, and for Brock and whenever you're, you know, you need a, a title challenger, like that seems to be what, you know, the game plan with him these days. But um i expect the next time we see him will either be the royal rumble or if they're doing a saudi show in february um you know that, that those seem to be the two and then mania you know like so he, he just does these big shows and i i think it's leaning more towards the gatekeeper role for him at this point you know like where he's just there to put people over there's no point in building around him because he only gets a handful of dates a year and you, you, you don't want to put the title on him. You already got Roman for that. Yeah. So yeah, that's kind of what I think. All right. So the second match on this show uh, was damage control versus Asuka and Alexa bliss. And they just did the title change on Monday. The women were wearing the full sleeved versions of their ring attire on this show. In some instances, I thought, the gear looked pretty cool, and in others, I didn't think it looked that great uh, for for some of the women. Um, this match was, I thought it was okay. It was it was pretty decent, especially when Asuka was on offense. Uh, basically, what happened is uh, there was interference uh, with uh, Nikki Cross, which caused Alexa Bliss to kind of. Uh, pause on the top rope and then she got crotched and then uh she uh she uh gosh who was oh it was uh it was uh eo uh ddt'd bliss while the ref were concerned with asuka and then dakota kai pinned bliss to win the match so they get their win back they get the belts back that was just a one week or less than a one week turn or one week title reign but uh it was it was okay but it was also this is where i was talking about it's a it was a raw match, right? There wasn't anything special. You had the Nikki Cross piece, which happened on Raw as well. Uh, but Paul, I know you're you're an avid Raw watcher still. Uh, so <laughs> I'm gonna lead with you because sure. you know I'm sort of hit or miss. I, I watch most of it, but I also watch the 90 minute Hulu cut, so I do miss some stuff. But compared to Monday, what did you think about this match? And what did you think about the the five day title run or whatever it was? I thought it was like almost the exact same match we got on Raw. Um, you know, minus commercials. Like I actually gave it the exact same rating. You know, I keep track of all the matches I watch and I have like a running spreadsheet that people can look at online if they care. Um, but uh, you know, I, I thought Asuka was really good. I thought it was interesting that in two straight matches, they had the baby face selling a knee, um, mm -hmm. you know, which was a little bit of mm, quality control, but Asuka did it differently um, and um, probably more traditionally than the way Brock did it. But I, I kind of liked both even though they were completely different. Um, I thought the best parts of this match, no surprise, were when e Eoskai and Asuka were in there together. But 
the whole match, you know, uh, Asuka was the highlight. She kept that thing together and yeah. it was a solid match. Like, you know, no questions. Um, I question why they even bothered doing the title change. But one thing you didn't mention was they did a pre-match interview and um, the Alexa was interrupted by Bray Wyatt. Yes. So that I think is going to play into storylines. All right, Brian, what do you think about this? Match, I... <sighs> I liked the work. I thought EO and Asuka actually worked really well together. I thought EO had a fantastic dragon screw. I was like, oh, somebody's trying to channel their inner ace today. All right, let's go. <laughs> but I, I don't want to be one of those guys to say the finish kind of ruined my experience, but it kind of did. The finish was kind of weird. It took like 10 minutes for the ref to kind of get EO and Asuka out from brawling. The back-to-back -back knee stuff was really weird. And I think, like, objectively, we need to really talk about damage control as a group. And I don't, I, I know that we're about at 90 days for Triple H as a booker, but I think this has been one of his biggest, like, mistakes so far as a booker because you have the fantastic presentation of these ladies and they've been losers because as a tag team, damage control, they went to the finals, so they lost the belts, won them, lost them, and they've won them again in a span of what, a month? And there's larger objective problems, what they're, they're doing with the tag division, but I don't believe them as a group. I think the direction, the momentum that they're trying to just forcefully have a war games with this, these damage control like group is it's really bad because they're not a threat at all. Bailey has already lost, uh, you know, twice to Bianca, which I'm sure we'll touch on, but I assumed once damage control won, I was like, okay, objectively, this is kind of dumb, doesn't really make any sense, but I was like, WWE loves taking pictures with factions with belts, so I just assumed Bailey was already going to win, but again, why couldn't have you just had a... I would have honestly had a screwy finish for Monday and then set up the title change and then win clean. They're obviously trying to do this where Nikki Cross is crazy now, and she's trying to be on their team for uh, war games, but... Um, yeah, I just overall it was fine, but then the finish kind of ruined my experience. So I kind of wonder if Sasha and Naomi play into this in any way. It's, uh, I, I don't know that. I know, you know, Sasha's continually saying, you know, something big's going to happen. I don't know, even know if that mean has anything to do with wrestling. Uh, I ultimately, I, I, I see where Brian is coming from, and we're going to have a discussion on Triple H at the end of this. Um, because I, I mean, this is just me reacting to, to fans, but that there's a low bar to make some of these fans happy and, and we, and we'll talk, but we'll talk about it. Uh, okay. So next match here is, uh, we're going to have a carrying cross, uh, segment here, carrying cross <sighs> versus drew McIntyre. And again, I'm going to go first with Paul because when carrying cross was at NXT, Paul saw enough in the presentation and in who he was that he said, look, this guy could be a future WrestleMania main eventer and it could happen soon. Then oh. they kind of did the thing that they did with him on raw and, and Vince just didn't see it in him. Uh, he got a, a second chance and this time they brought Scarlett back. They did the whole NXT gimmick. This looks to be triple H's baby and he hasn't, really gotten over with it they're giving him lots and lots of opportunity uh drew mcintyre is in this feud i think it's a little bit of a waste of drew's talent but also there's not really anything else here for, for drew to do so it's it's kind of okay but this was a cage match this was not a great cage match uh, you know, the the escape the rules or escape the cage rules when they were hitting on that so hard in the beginning I kind of was like, okay, now I know what this finish is going to be. There, there was some cool stuff in the beginning. You know, two big dudes who were kind of athletic, hitting each other hard and doing cool stuff. But it never built to anything. And the, so the, in, in the finish comes where, where Drew is escaping the cage. Uh, Scarlet sprays him in the face, so he's blinded. She also sprays the official. And uh, Karen Cross is now trying to come out. He gets caught. Uh, and and Drew decides to go over the top to beat him out to to win the match. And, you know, there, there wasn't even a photo finish. Drew clearly <laughs> got out before Karen Cross did. So I'm not sure exactly what they were trying to do. Uh, it wasn't Hogan and, and, and Orndorff uh, in any way. I didn't really yeah. think the match was that good either. I saw a lot of comments 
from people saying, oh, you know, maybe it's Karen Cross's best match. I was like, <laughs> like there was a line that Michael Cole said in the very beginning where he's like, this is slow and plotting like we expected. <laughs> and I was like, is that your version of Jim Ross's bowling shoe ugly? Um, but yeah, like, you know, I, I, I asked this last night with Dave on Wrestling Observer Radio. I said, you know, it, what's up? With, you know, how, how hard are they going to continue to push this guy if he's not giving them the goods? And I'm not saying this is his last chance, but, you know, if you have this information here and you have uh you know few the clash of the castle and 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 stuff you have you have you have these examples and now you have the data now what do, now what do we do are we going to continue to force the carrying cross thing or are we going to sort you know kind of pull it back and, and figure out if there's anything else we can do so that was a long preamble but paul i know you have a lot to say kind of um so first off i'll say i when i thought that Karen Cross was going to do really well in WWE wasn't even in NXT. It was when I saw him in impact okay. and, and I, and I saw like that package and I thought, man, this would go over really well in WWE for me. And it that's blood sport. I didn't see that, but I, but I, I think really liked the same time. Sport. Yeah. But, but I did say like at that time, I said, this guy will be main eventing WrestleMania. I think I said within three years yeah. and I even famously made a bet about it that I was pretty <laughs> sure I had lost and now I'm still alive, but it's, I'm on fumes. Um, so what I would say about this one, I do think it was his best match in W uh, on the main roster, but it's a really low bar. Yeah. Um, and um, the other thing is what I thought here was this is the first time uh, that we've seen him where, you know, on a big stage with the entrance, the entrance is a main event entrance. And, and he looked like a superstar coming out with the, you know, Scarlet and everything. And that's, I think what triple H probably envisioned in his mind. And, but then what's problem is, is the in ring doesn't even come close to matching up to it and it's not working. And I don't know. I, I don't know if it can be salvaged, but I know what I would do to salvage it is I would just have him wrecking dudes every week and, you know, and forget about these 15 minute matches going back and forth with Drew McIntyre or anybody else for that matter, you know, build them up the way you would traditionally build up a killer heel and then feed them to a baby face. Like that's the best use of him, you know, at this point, because I think that's his ceiling. I don't think he can reinvent event WrestleMania. I'm not saying he won't. And even when I made that prediction, it wasn't that I thought he deserved it. I just thought that that's what they would do with him um now i'm not so sure um and and you mentioned that he's triple h's baby and i agree with that so if he does make it that far that's just going to be triple h saying i don't care what the fans think he's going to be main event in wrestlemania and you know yeah and, the, and those uh, as the booker those mm -hmm. are the those are the decisions he's going to have to make right you know yeah. the, he, those are hard decisions when your pet project is not working when do you cut bait on it Vince literally sometimes would cut bait on day one and not give it a chance. And Triple H is giving it a chance. You know what my biggest fear is? Is My biggest fear is that they're going to still do cross and reigns at some point when they tease that. Remember in the very beginning, they teased it. And if Triple H is going to be very stubborn about this and say, look, you know, I mean, maybe they do have maybe they have one thing left that they can do, which is. Let's get rid of the hair. It's the hair that's that's not working. Let's get rid of the hair so he's bald again. Uh, but yeah, that's my biggest worry is that they decide, well, you know, let, let's get the full use out of him and and let's put him with Reigns and then Reigns beats him and then we'll see what happens after that. And maybe they go back to the drawing board. Okay, Brian, I know you have a lot to say. <laughs> well, uh, I've got, I want to jump off a, a few things Paul said because I, I was harking back to the promo off he had against Adam Cole where Cole pretty much buried him and said, you know, hey, you have all this, but you know what they do to make me feel special? They ring the freaking bell. <laughs> and that's the biggest thing with these guys. Eventually, you have to get in the ring. And it's funny that Paul said that Karen Cross is Triple H's baby. And I'm going to say this as soft as I can. If What year was it that Triple H got doughy? Because I'm looking at Triple H right now and Karen Cross. I like, think it's when they were trying to have children. <laughs> I, I I mean, hey, I don't know. Like, got the he just looks bigger than because if you look at his shape now compared to NXT, it's very different. 
And the thing about Triple H's booking patterns, he loves to put guys in 17 to 18 minute matches. And it's like, he does not need to be working these matches where I'm sorry, his fundamentals are not that good. Have you tried to see this guy laying a foot stomp? Now he did a boy cycle knee today, which I was, he kind of impressed me by that. Like good on you carrying cross, but like, you can't have a guy work a match if he's not a worker. That's why if he was just killing guys in a minute, I would be less bothered, but this guy is not it. I'm like, I was like optimistic when he came back. I was like, Ooh, okay. Cause I wasn't really watching him. And it, like, as he was a free agent to see what he's done to improve his game, but like his promos are just nonsense to me. They don't make sense. Like, and I was really worried that they were going to feed drew to this guy. And what's even worse now the feud is going to continue. You've already had two stipulation matches with these guys. What are you going to do? Are you going to have a last man standing? You're going to have hell on a cell. You got to have a fight pit. Like, I don't want to see carrying cross in any of these more matches. And the amazing thing about carrying cross in his style, the match only went 13 minutes. He makes matches feel like 25 minutes. Like they're so long. Cause like that strap match back in extreme roles. I don't know how you guys uh, face. I'm sorry if I'm going on a tangent here. That was that match only went 10 minutes. That felt 25 minutes because it's so – and it's funny that Cole said – what was Cole's line? It's like this is uh, slow and methodical. That's his matches, and they're not good. Yeah, you know, the, I think the, the problem, and, and this is something that Triple H is going to have to figure out, when the fan base tells you that this person is not good and then you keep trying to do it, like that was Roman Reigns in 2013 or 14 or whenever that was, right? Where where the fans started to resent him. Now, Karrion Cross is a heel, so it's a little bit different. He's, they're not forcing him as a baby face. But still, like your fan base is saying, hey, I'm telling you he is not it. That's that's a choice that Triple H is going to have to figure out uh, and, and see. You know, he maybe he will feel that he's uh, smarter than than everybody else, right? He's smarter than the fans. That's what Vince would say. Um, well, so Garrett, yeah, we'll what, see. What's worse is okay. It's one thing to push your guy right, but he's not even getting a reaction. That that's no. that's worse. That's, that's the key. Worse. That's the key. Yes, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And and they give him the smoke and mirrors. He's got Scarlet with him, and and she, you know, she's a great part of that act. And it's just it's just not it's just not hitting. And and they'll the, like I said, he'll have to figure out what to do there. Okay. So next match, and this was very much to me a Monday Night Raw match, and it was fine. It was fun, which is Judgment Day against the OC. Uh, the the whole and and I think everyone knew this is where it was going to go, which is Rhea's going to get involved and somehow and, and lead to the finish, which is exact exactly what happened. I think the one thing for me is that in a match that wasn't designed to get Dominic Mysterio the attention, he was just sort of hidden. Like, I didn't even really, I didn't even notice him most of the time in this match. So that was really interesting. Uh, and then, you know, Rhea gets involved. AJ, uh, it goes to the outside. She gets him on her shoulders, and then she uh, drops him face first on the side of the apron, which sets up Finn Balor, that shotgun uh, drop kick, and the coup de gras to win the match for the heels. Um I, I, Paul, do you see it as anything more than just a solid Raw Monday Night Raw wrestling match? No, I mean the the one thing, and this is actually the end of this match was where it hit me that this was basically just like a TV show with you know slightly better matches. Was that that finish called for uh, someone to run out and save you know like the woman, and that's what we would normally get on a big pay per view. Um, would would be that re you know kind of continuation of this feud to take it to another direction, and I, I guess we're either going to get that on TV or at Survivor Series, probably on TV to set up Survivor Series. Um, the one notable thing from this match, I thought, and it was actually during the uh, I think it was during the entrances, they actually referred to Carl Anderson as the never open weight champion, which I never <laughs> thought I would hear on WWE television. And then you know they did the backstory. They did it in the women's tag match too. They were talking about some stardom angles and you know former you know so so I, I like that. And I think Oscar and Io not liking each other. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's clear that we're probably going to see Carl Anderson at um, Wrestle Kingdom uh, based on the fact that they're promoting it, which is very interesting, you know, between that and Mudo 
and Shinsuke doing a match on you know in J- on that same week in Japan is it, very interesting. Oh yeah, like but, it's, yeah. it's it, it, I mean it's a change, a hundred percent change. Well, and and it's interesting because you know I don't know if AEW is sending anyone to the dome uh, because of the fact that they're doing that Seattle Dynamite. So um, I don't think it means that you know Triple H and Nick Lance Khan Archer. worked out a deal. Oh, wait, Lance, oh wait, is he? <laughs> Lance is he there? Yeah. No, I'm oh, okay. just saying that's a guy uh, who's not well, on TV. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, they can send guys that aren't on TV, but the match was good. You know, is like I said, it was when I made when I say these are raw matches. I mean, they're good raw matches, yeah, but it, they're just raw totally matches. fine raw match. Yeah. And, 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 and I, I was know, fine and, with it. Yeah, and but but again, no, not a clean finish. A lot of the finishes tonight too. Like we, I kind of noticed this up until the the semi main event kind of came out of nowhere. Um, you know, so that was another reason why it kind of felt like TV matches. Uh, Brian, you could you could add anything you want, but I also want to ask you a question, which is we are leading to where someone is out there to combat Rhea. A lot of people are speculating Raquel. Some have said Charlotte, though. Would Charlotte want to be aligned with that group? Um, doesn't uh, doesn't Luke Gallows have a wife who is a wrestler? Does he? Is that is that wrong? I'm not I, sure. I could be I could be having that wrong. I that, that 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 I might be way off on that. But I was just trying to think. It almost seems too predictable for it to be Raquel. Charlotte would be awesome, but then she's got to come back as a baby face, which I'm not sure she wants to do. Who else is out there? Who who would you put in that spot, Brian? I mean, easy answer, Raquel. I think honestly, Raquel being paired with the doc gallows and carl anderson that would give her a little personality to be honest because you know her presentation has been kind of like smiley mommy diesel and for someone of her size and athleticism she needs a little something else and that's where i feel like in her character that's where she's missing something so that's the easy answer uh i mean i would say beth phoenix because Rhea did try to kill her with the concerto so that all that's another one i don't like charlotte because at it's a class of personalities. And if she's going to just be an a-hole, like being paired with him, that doesn't really make sense. Give me There's smiling not... baby face, Charlotte. Oh, Come on. God, no. <laughs> um, and God forbid, there's not really anybody on the NXT roster that you would even entertain that with. Maybe Tiffany Stratton. I, I, I don't know. I was just trying to think of an odd, like a curveball among a curveball, but other do, than do that, do drop hasn't done much of late. Uh, Nikki Cross one. is 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 a wild card. So there are women who are out there, but I, I, you know, I think Raquel is the one that everyone thinks just because of the size. And 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 it's fun because if both women continue to to do well, Raquel and Rhea will sort of be compared to you know to each other uh, in, in in that way. Well, and then if you get Raquel, you can have Raquel and Rhea have like a power slam off where Raquel's power slamming Damien Priest and then she <laughs> Rhea's uh, do- power slamming Doc Gallows. I mean, that that's easy. That's an easy gift right there. For you. You're welcome, Hunter. Yes. Uh, oh, I, so, I lean, oh I here, lean. here's a here's here. I think this may be I don't know if this is Andrew Zarian or not, but the Matt Men podcast, uh, YouTube podcast said Blair Davenport. Oh no, it was it's uh, their producer. I think it's one of their producers. So I, yeah, I lean Charlotte. I lean Charlotte just because of the history with Charlotte and AJ. Um, you know, like real good friends backstage and also on screen. You know, with the former tag team in the Mixed Match Challenge, and they've done like social media stuff together and whatnot. You know, so y- you know what you just reminded me of? There's what, an Braun unresolved storyline. Remember, Triple H said he's going to pay off that Charlotte Rhea Ripley storyline. <laughs> Oh, there you go. Good God. From, ah. from, from Re- WrestleMania, uh, the pandemic WrestleMania. There you go. Oh, there you go. So... But but he's also, you know, like with the Good Brothers, she's healed. She should be a baby face that everybody doesn't like. Yeah. Just true. like the Good Brothers. True. <laughs> Very true. Very true. Uh, all right. We're going to get a little bit more to, to what you guys were talking about when it came to talking about the Bullet Club and all that. And we'll, we'll, we'll have a bigger Triple H discussion uh, in, in a second here. Uh, look, look, I'll start with with Brian here because he's the one who mentioned this match before. Omos and Braun Strowman. It started out with the test of strength, selling from Strowman, uh, body slams from Omos. Strowman tried to body slam Omos, couldn't get him up. Strowman's punches didn't do much. He tried to clothesline Omos over the top rope. It was like Jericho and Colt Cabana from uh, from Wednesday. Uh, finally got Omos over, and Omos went over fast. I was a little worried there. 
Um, Omos ris- missed a running avalanche in the corner, and then Strowman picked him up and power slammed him to win the match. Personally, I was not impressed with this match, but I didn't expect to be. It was like exactly what I thought it was going to be. Uh, Strowman selling is an interesting look. Uh, I thought Omos had that big man like charisma and confidence, but ultimately, I don't think they were beating Strowman. So you were kind of backed into a corner about what you were going to do. And Strowman beat him clean. I, I don't know what that means for Omos, though, because every time Omos does something and then he goes away and you have to sort of recreate this big scary man angle all over again as if we didn't see television three months ago so i i I just don't know how you continue to to utilize this guy but uh, brian give me your thoughts i will say i really liked almost his gear i felt like this was the first time he was actually showing a little bit of personality and touch to his character because he's always so boring with his tank tops and also MVP wasn't there because he was written off, uh, you know, the show because he got beat up by Braun Strowman. So this was really just I think this was the only match that went like 100 percent clean, so to speak. Well, I mean, there was the last women standing match, but like from a regular wrestling match, this was the only match that went like 100 percent clean without anything screwy, like as far as the finish goes. It didn't overstay its welcome. I don't have the time in front of me, but there's no way this went more than six minutes. I said this had the potential to be big, dumb guy fun. And it was. It really was. And almost, you know, we've seen those matches with Bobby Lashley. Oof. Those oof, those matches were just <laughs> not good. And he moved around pretty good. I don't know if he's uh, worked, been working out a little bit more. You can tell. He, I don't know if somebody's been working with him to run the ropes. I was really impressed, like, the way he was moving because if you go back in those matches, he was tag champs with AJ. He was kind of just the heavy that would do the very dangerous tree slam. And it's been like, oh, okay, we just need you for the hot tag. But, like, the entire match, I was really impressed. And Braun, out of the guys Hunter's actually brought back, I think Strowman, to me, I felt like he's looked the most impressive out of anybody he's really brought back because – You know, I'm actually, um, I'm in charge of the hits and misses uh, piece for PW Torch, so I'm a SmackDown watcher. But, like, Mm -hmm. he's come back, I think, with a better attitude. You can tell his work has been better. Like you said, Gary, him selling was a certain, it was a different perspective. But it wasn't awful. I wasn't offended by anything he did. And Braun going over, like, made sense. And there wasn't interference. Nice, big dumb guy fun now what do you do with almost i uh i i mean i would probably put him down in nxt maybe you have him and braun breaker and have braun breaker beat almost just for fun i don't i don't really know because it almost isn't teflon but i don't think almost eating another l is really going to hurt his trajectory because what is his trajectory at this point almost and brock lesnar <laughs> uh all right paul what you think <laughs> Uh, well, I, I definitely think it was Omos's best match. Um, although, like, I don't know, I maybe didn't like it quite as much as Brian did, but probably a little bit more than you did. Um, the um, I would say this is like the 2022 version of Andre the Giant and Big John Stud, and it was a lot better. Which than was that. terrible. <laughs> yeah, I know it was a lot better than that. Um, Lance Storm made the joke, uh, but we would have needed MVP to come out with a bag of money and mm-hmm. then spread it out to the crowd. The body Slam was, Challenge, that, baby. That WrestleMania won. Yeah. Um, I thought, you know, I, I like something Brian said um, uh, in terms of people that Triple H has brought back. Um, I think he's been the most successful in some ways, certainly over um, performing as due to maybe people's expectations because he's so over with the crowd. And if you look at his uh, viewership segments, like he always increases the viewership. Um, I think he might be built, being built up. You know, we talked about earlier what's next for Roman. I didn't even think of him, but that would make sense. And uh, the Royal Rumble is a time when they tend to give guys title shots that you really think have zero chance to win, and they don't even really bother trying to build it up. That could be a match for Roman Reigns. You know, I'm sure that, you know, I'm, I know they've wrestled before, but it's been a while, and they could easily do that match again, and I'm sure it'd be a lot of fun. You're not ready for Roman Reigns and Bill Goldberg? I'm sure that's coming to you. <laughs> Probably the next Saudi Mania show. Uh, all right, let, let's uh, let's move along here. So the match where I felt 
uh, that at least slightly over delivered from what I thought. And, you know, some of this has to do with, I don't know if Ridge Holland is going to get any most improved wrestler votes, but he is way better than I realized, right? Like just, uh, obviously everyone loves Pete Dunn, you know, Butch, uh, but Ridge kind of sits in, in the back there because Butch has got the small person gimmick and, you know, Seamus is, is talk about someone who's, I don't know if he's improved, but just someone who's been able to keep it at a, a certain level as he ages very gracefully. Uh, Seamus is great. And so Ridge Holland is kind of like lost in the shuffle a little bit, but I've just, I was impressed with him. I'm like, you know, I remember when this guy, like his leg collapsed on, on NXT, right. And to come back and, and doing what he's doing a good part of this act. Uh, I thought, I thought he was good. And you know, the Usos are the Usos. They're always generally good. Uh, this is where all the Sami Zayn chants happened. Uh, there was a um, there was a nice little little spot where uh, the the Usos had done that double big splash, and I was thinking like, oh, okay, maybe, maybe that could be the finish. But the way that now this is a little bit of a difference between how WWE shoots stuff versus AEW. WWE shot it in a way where seeing Ridge interfere. Like it just comes out of the, like you're like oh my gosh like there he is, in AEW you kind of would have seen it a little bit more. It wouldn't have been as big of a surprise. You're just like oh there he is. He's coming in the way that WWE shot this. I thought was really good. Uh, and then we got um, I, I know a, a spot that Paul really liked. Paul, why don't you explain the the fake uh, the fake out spot? I loved it. Like the, the there's a spot where you know like Butch was about to come off the top rope, and we've seen this spot before where a guy's coming off the top. And then he gets hit by a super kick and Butch went like he was going to jump. And then Jay, I think it was Jay shot for the super kick and extended fully and completely missed. And I loved it because it, it, it made it, it added a sense of realism to it, mm -hmm. you know, to where like, you know, like normally you would see like maybe Butch would jump over him or whatever, but Butch saw the super kick coming. So decided I'm just going to wait here. And, and, and Jimmy or Jay just waited. I, I just, I just love that attention to detail. Um, I don't know if you can give Rich Holland the most improved wrestler in the same year that he broke Biggie's neck. No, um, I, I and, know, <laughs> but, but that, uh, that was, that was rough. That was rough. Yeah. That was but definitely rough. I, my vote goes to Solo Sokoa, but, but Ridge is, I mean, he's done so much better on the main roster than I thought he would given what I saw in NXT. Although I did, I know John LaRocca and myself were both, very impressed with him in NXT UK. And I think that we're getting to see that now, which I think some, for some reason it just never transpired in NXT, NXT proper, probably because of the injury. Yeah. Um, but, but he's done a really good job here. Um, but yeah, this match was, I enjoyed this match. It was a very good SmackDown main event, you know, mm -hmm. and you know, and, and, but it just never hit. It seemed like they were heading to a classic match and they just never got there. So near the end, Butch or uh, uh, Ridge started doing all of Sheamus's moves, including the white noise. I think the crowd bought that one as a possible finish. It was not. Uh, the Usos double super kicked Ridge to the outside, so he was out. Uh, Jay had Butch on the top rope, and he fell backwards in the like the old 3D, which is they call the 1D. But it was like a 3D from the top rope as Jimmy hit the hit the little uh, hit the cutter, and so that was a that was a nice a nice way to finish the match. Uh, and and the Usos are still the champions. We we would see them uh, later in the show in the main event. Brian, quick thoughts on on this since you know you're watching SmackDown, so you could see these guys every week. Yeah, um, I will say I wasn't obviously a fan of them running this back being that they had the um, main event match about two or three weeks ago, their main event match uh, on SmackDown was probably way better than this. Uh, I actually wanted to agree with you, Garrett, as far as, you know, being the SmackDown representative of PW torch, Rich Holland has actually gotten so much better. If, if we can try to look at anything to come out of the big E situation, I think after that situation, I don't know if Seamus Butch really took him aside and it's like big fella, You've got so much talent, but we've got to get you to like tone it down a little bit because I think he was just like this big ball of energy that he didn't know how to like really work because he had so much like power 
over anybody. And I agree with Paul. I did actually like his work in NXT UK. I did not like his work when he was brought to the uh, black and gold NXT because I felt like something was going on where they were trying to like pound like the independent wrestler out of him or something. Like It's just something was trying to change. But I think based on his rug, because I believe he's got a rugby background because I think Sheamus has been really, I like, I have no idea. I'm just speculating here. I feel like Sheamus has been really able to work with him. And then like big fella, the, I'm 45 years old and I'm doing this for a long time with neck problems. Let me show you how to work like a big guy. All right. So um, let's quickly get through the, the rest of these matches here. Cause I do want to talk about the, uh, the triple H thing. Um, Bianca and Bailey. If I never see a last man standing match, I'll be totally fine with that. Uh, it, it really hurts the rhythm of, of a natural pro wrestling match because there's no peaks and valleys, natural peaks, peaks and valleys. It's all about trying to do something to keep somebody down, but they usually it's kind of like this, this way where, you know, you're just so mad that, that it's about violence and it's about knocking people out. But here it was more about trapping people. Uh, Bailey trapped Bianca in the steps. Then she tried to trap her in a trunk. She tried to trap her in the ladder. Uh, and this is not to say that, that the women didn't do good entertaining stuff because they did. It's just the match in of itself. Then they added a golf cart. Uh, I know that <laughs> Paul got a kick out of uh, Michael Cole talking about live golf, uh, which sort of fit the story of this show. Um, there was a there was a cross face, and then uh, they were they were jumping. They both jumped to the top of this golf cart. The golf cart couldn't drive fast enough for it to be dangerous. Like there's this moment where Becky or Bailey is driving it, and Bianca's like supposed to like try and jump out of the way, but the thing took forever to get there. So she just kind of juked it once and was like, "Eh, I'm just gonna get to the side. Like this thing's not getting here." And then so Bianca's driving it with Bailey on top of it. And the spot is that she's going to toss Bailey from the top of this golf cart through a table. And if that would have been the finish, I would have been like, oh, I really like that finish. Instead, Bailey bounced off and, and Bailey was had, had a hold on to Bianca's hair. And so Bailey bounced off. She didn't go through the table. Uh, and so then they go back in the ring. Uh, Bianca does the um, the KOD on to a chair that was standing up and Bianca, uh, I'm sorry, Bailey kind of maneuvered the chair. Like maybe it was out of place. So it kind of looked funky. Finally, she put Bailey inside the ladder, closed the ladder. And so Bailey was trapped inside the ladder. Couldn't get up. They counted to 10. So match was the last man standing match. Uh, it was there. There was, it was overbooked to, to say the least. And uh, I would rather seen Bianca win by true knockout instead of, you know, this trapping thing. But maybe that trapping thing is to save Bailey's face a little bit. Uh, but who knows that I, I was it was good, but I felt like it should have been a lot better. And probably because of the gimmick of the match probably was was the reason. Brian, did you want to go? Yeah, for sure. I, I will say I, I think they would have had a, a better match if it was just a straight up wrestling match. Uh, Garrett, you had mentioned, I guess, their challenges with this match. I I don't know the terms of how violent wrestling matches can be over there, but I kind of felt like that did take away from a lot traditionally what a last man, last woman standing match is going to be. They I commend them for trying to think outside of the box on the spots like the the stairs spot was really clever. I was really worried. There was like a spot where Bianca like hit her neck on the stairs or something like that. And they didn't, anytime they don't replay it, I'm just like, uh Oh, <laughs> but that, that's never good. So, uh, cause we've got captain replay in the back. So, you know, he's going to do that. So, you know, I, I think Bianca tried to make the best of everything. I think Bailey getting stuck under a ladder of all things is kind of lame. I just, I don't really see that being believable. And then we've got more knee stuff. So we've got three matches with knee stuff, which I'm just like, guys, y'all, y'all got to talk to each other. I, I mean, there's eight matches on this card. So I know it wasn't back to back like the first and second, but we've got to be a little bit more disciplined there. So Paul, you watch UFC. Mm-hmm. They, there are sometimes the same injury or the same style of match. Does it, it doesn't really take away from, 
the UFC stuff. So why does it take away when we're watching pro wrestling? Well, I think it's because we know it's booked. And so, and it's, it's more about the story of the match as opposed to the, you know, the match itself. So if the story of the match is somebody selling their knee, do you really want to see that story back to back? I think is maybe what it's about. Whereas, you know, when you're watching sports, like, you know, if you watch a basketball game and the Warriors win by 20 and then the next night they also win by 20, like, you know, it's just the Warriors game, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the way I look at it. Um, any quick thoughts on this? Yeah. Um, I just, um, I thought it was the best match up to this point for me. Like I liked it a little bit better than the tag match, but I think I in general like last man standing matches a little more, a lot more probably than you. I know there was a Adam Cole match in NXT that everyone hated and I absolutely loved. I think it was <laughs> I just, Kyle you just O'Reilly. see it too much. It's not yeah. it's the, this and the ladder match in WWE are just yeah. but I like it. They just go over they just use these all the time. And I liked some of the unique spots that they did, um, you know, like even though maybe they were corny or whatever and contrived, but I just kind of liked them. You know, they were different and I like different. Um, I thought Sammy Guevara needs to watch a tape of this match so he can figure out how to get out of the way of a golf cart. Um, you know, or maybe maybe just give Bianca a call and 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 tell tell her because I was I was waiting for that, you know, to, for her to do the Sammy bump. And then she just got out of the way. It's like, well, why can't uh, Sammy do that? Um, although I don't think he's on the on the speed dial of too many women in WWE. Um, so yeah, I, I liked the match, uh, you know, and, and I thought this was the first match on the show where it felt like an actual pay-per-view match to me, like not something we would see on TV. So to me, this is where the show kind of moved from a really good TV show to a pay-per-view. All right. Last two things here. There was a Bray Wyatt interview. I will quickly recap it. Bray said, the mask made him not afraid and untouchable. It feels good. Compares it in like this roundabout way to drugs and temptation. The monster destroyed him and then he was alone. People don't love Bray for Bray. Bray is here to rewrite the ending of his story. The video plays uh, on the big screen trying to tempt him to put the mask on again. So that's the, that. that's the story here. Uh, this is a, a roundabout way uh, of wherever we're getting with him. Ultimately, Paul, where are we going with him? Is he going to have matches? Uh, can we continue extending this thing before it loses all the coolness that it that it came in with? Where's it going? I have no idea. Is he going to wrestle people? I assume so. Who's that going to be? I have no idea. Um, I I was disappointed with this segment because I thought that last night on SmackDown, they had an, a backstage interview where we got to see a different part of Bray Wyatt that we haven't seen since he came back. And I really thought that that was like the direction this thing was going. And maybe it is, but we didn't see it here where he was like he was mad about being um interrupted all the time and he was about to snap and i was like i'm watching this and he explained it he compared it to getting cut off on the highway and feeling frustrated and wanting to like catch up with the guy and like you know basically like road rage and i was like i could totally identify with that and here i'm just like oh man this is just the same old crap we've seen every single time since he's come back so um and i this uncle howdy stuff i'm just like, I don't want to see it. I want to, I want them to move on and get to whatever's next. And I have no idea what that is. So I don't want to pass judgment on this thing. Cause I feel like that would be like telling you 15 minutes into a movie that the movie sucks or, you know, closing a book after the first chapter and saying, I'm done with this, but I could see people doing that yeah. if they get frustrated. Yeah. So like, that's kind of where I'm at. Uh, Brian, do you think, so here, here's my thought on Bray. I like all this stuff. I like the creativity around it. I like seeing him back. I've always liked him as a character. He still has got to wrestle. And when he wrestles, that's an issue, right? It sounds like th this whole metaphor is probably also having to do with how his character was portrayed in his last stint, right? Like the, the fiend and, and everything. So ultimately are, are you, are you still into this or are you not into this? And, and where do you think we're, we're going with this thing? I was out after the uh, opening night promo. You can't have you. Uh, the way I phrased it, Garrett, uh, when I tweeted the the night I saw that promo, I was intrigued. I was on the hook for his comeback promo. But the minute you start addressing like your personal struggles and then your inner half uh, spooky self comes on the screen, I'm not. I'm done. 
because the way I phrase it is, could you imagine John Moxley cutting his promo after coming back from rehab and then like Dean Ambrose coming on the screen or <laughs> Cody Rhodes coming back from injury and then Stardust pops on screen? You can't the free, do that. The three and I, faces of Foley, man. That, and, and, and that's the thing. And I'm so glad people, some people, Bray Wyatt, that, that's their guy. That's your CM Punk. Like so yeah. happy for you that like, but again, eventually he has to wrestle and the problem with Bray, he, like, if he's going to stay this popular with his WWE audience, they're going to eventually put him in the atmosphere of some guys. And God forbid if Drew McIntyre has to get fed to this guy, because I don't know if you guys noticed, but he was sweating bullets in that ring. Bullets. Like, he had just worked seven or eight minutes. And he was just standing there. Like, I know that was obviously, like, a big discussion point on why he got released because of his weight potentially but like if this was like the pandemic era maybe he could feed with himself and be fine but like realistically i challenge someone to tell me this is good like i'm sorry this sucks paul i'm gonna be nicer and this sucks what if what if it's but what if it's bo what if the whole video thing is bo Uh, okay make it better or worse it, it's the yeah. same. There's no difference because like, but, I mean, but he's uh, not feuding with himself in this fantasy way, right? It's actually a different person. Uh, I mean, it, Garrett, it, it really is. It's the same, man, because there's his dialogue. Nothing's really changed. He's kind of rehashing the same stuff that he did a decade ago. I don't really no, see I, that. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I agree. I, I'm just, I'm just trying to find out what could work because i have the same worries like it's just, I, my worry is that they're gonna run the course of this thing and then it's not going to be cool anymore and then he's done that's my worry and i hope not because i, I like him i think he's i think he's an interesting dude uh, okay last question here last topic um we're going to talk about triple h and uh, uh I'll, we'll let paul give his quick thing and he's got to take his daughter to swimming so we're going to let paul go and then brian and i will we'll wrap up the show but there was a lot of commentary about how Michael Cole was able to say the Bullet Club and how this is so much better than Vince. And and I was like, well, you know, there's this really a, a low bar when when that is the case. <laughs> and I've said this on, on, a, on a few different shows so far to me. All Triple H has done is hit control Z on the Vince stuff that the fans didn't like. He's just said, nope, we're going to undo that. And 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 then we're gonna go. Now I think he'll have to be judged by what he brings to the table. What's new? What is the change? Uh, the, you know, this whole NXT Europe and, and this expansion, like that, could be his legacy. But from a booking perspective, on day to day WWE, how do you guys gauge this so far? Because a lot of the WWE fans are just like. As long as Vince is gone, and I know that I don't have to watch the show with him being in charge, I'm good. My bar is a little bit higher, but Paul, you know, what do you think about this? Um, you know, little changes, like you mentioned, the the um, you know mentioning other companies and uh, mentioning the referees' names, you know, stuff like that is is you know different. Um, the in terms of the actual booking, you know, it's it's basic. It it makes sense. Storylines aren't getting dropped within three weeks. So, you know, it's like you said, it's the bare minimum of what needed to be done um, to say that it's, you know, a massive. Well, it is a massive improvement, but to say it's like, you know, he's revolutionizing the industry or anything like that. He's not doing that. Um, one one thing I would say about these these pay-per-views or PLEs or whatever you want to call them, they flow so much better. Like these these shows are much easier to watch. There isn't so much downtime between matches. Um, so in that sense, I think it's an improvement. It reminds me more of the NXT TakeOver format of doing shows where it's just match, you know, short video package, match, short bit, you know, boom, 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 as opposed to like six video packages in between each match. And that was you know, 10 minute man. Yeah. But you know what? <laughs> well, I was there live, so it probably felt different, you know, uh, but that was also Vince. So maybe this year, you know, it'll be different. So I would say, you know, like maybe like this show, I'd give them, you know, a C or a B minus, you know, but, but I mean, we're coming from probably the last 10 years of F, you know, so that's why it feels so much better. Uh, But, but I mean, it's, he's got some work to do and the, the, um, the bloom is going to be off that rose probably by about WrestleMania. So that's where, you know, I think 
that's where we'll get a sense of, okay, what's his direction? What's his, his outlook? What's his, his vision of WWE in 2023. And, and then we can kind of pass judgment on it. So I think we got to give them, you know, a good six months and, and, or eight, maybe like by WrestleMania, I think we can make a pretty fair assessment. But so far I can't really say it's, I'm, I, you know, I, I would give him a passing grade, but that's about it. All right. We're going to let Paul go. He's got to do some stuff. Paul, thanks for being here. Uh, Paul does work here on F4W online, and he also does some podcasts on the fight game media network. Check out his Twitter at Paul Ace Fontaine. Thanks for being here, man. All right, Brian. So, uh, so let's finish this thing out. Uh, we don't have, we don't have that much to go by the way. Um, cool. Give give me your give me your thoughts on uh, on the, the 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 Triple H stuff. Ah man, like uh, I'm I'm like you when I'm reviewing something, I try to not like use like oh it's WWE you have to grade it on a curve. I try to be objective and as I can when I'm actually viewing just wrestling in general. So if the bar is like yeah he's not Vince okay so like maybe you went from an F to a D. But I, I want to question, like, what is he booked? Like, I don't think he's really booked anything. The Roman and blood, Bloodline stuff, that's that's Sammy. That Like, Triple H isn't doing anything there. I mean, you could say, I guess the nicest thing he can say, I can say he's gotten Gunther on TV. I still hate the name, but at least he's on television doing good stuff. Hopefully they've fixed the mid card title situation which like uh, that's bare that's bare bones booking stuff but to me garrett like i'm surprised that you know you dave or brian or um on wrestling observer haven't brought this up yet he's kind of doing tony khan stuff that tony khan would get criticized tremendously he's getting the pops he's bringing back all his guys and getting the pops eventually the pops are gonna run out and he has to start booking like so that and, but that but that is a positive thing that tony was doing right that was fan servicing to the max and i i like i think those things were were good now it, the the negative on on sometimes doing that stuff is you you go to the well one too many times or you do it and the person the crowd that's not who the crowd wants it to be and so it's kind of deflating so you know but tony learned like you know he had some really great ones some fantastic ones and he had some not so fantastic ones, but for Triple H to copy that, I think that was smart. Like he, that's how he's fan servicing to an extent. I know, but Garrett, that reaction to Emma was pretty pretty quiet. The uh, two weeks ago, it just it. I think people had expectations of somebody else. And another thing, which is funny, because the problem with WWE back in 2018, 2019, bloated roster because. You know, Triple H has bought in like they're like a double digit of people now, and they already had a pretty big roster. Eventually, those guys and gals not getting that were getting ring time, but now Triple H is bringing in his own guys. Are they going to be like, hey, like what's going on here? Maybe I need to start looking elsewhere. Maybe I need to start looking into Impact, New Japan, AEW, somewhere else. I just wonder if there's going to have that carryover effect where people. You, we're going to start hearing stuff where people are upset about their time. Hey, like why is Ron Strowman getting so much time? Why is carrying cross getting so much time? Why are all these new people getting time? Because there are people that should be on television more like, uh, is Ali and Ricochet. Like they, like they're featured guys, but I mean, they could be getting more spots and triple H is going to envision however he wants this WWE to be i said i think it's completely fair to give him kind of triple h a progress report grade which is you know about 90 days i think that's fair and to be quite honest like you were saying earlier people want to congratulate him on these seismic changes it's really not that much changes it's really just old hat stuff and especially the way hunter books he's always booking best for business just like his father-in-law i mean that's who he learned from so yeah the apple's so there, not going to fall not too far from the tree. The, but undoing, like ha acknowledging Vince's faults and undoing some of that stuff to babyface yourself is very smart. It, to to make your your fan base 
feel like they are being heard if if they are being heard or not being heard at least there's the optics that that is happening i think that's that's really smart like i don't have like i like i i like the idea of triple h running you know the creative side that doesn't mean that you know he's gonna it's gonna be an a plus and it's gonna be new japan pro wrestling 2018 like that's not what this is ever going to be Right. But they could be a better mm-hmm. version of what they were. And, and that's that's what I want to see. But I also want to see him finally do something that that is kind of his own. And and Karen Cross is, is one of those things. It's not working. There are some other wrestlers, like you said, the Emma thing. I thought that was also a little bit tone deaf. Um, uh, but uh, but yeah, so, you know, we'll, we'll we'll see and and we'll we'll keep an eye on it. And we'll I, I think Russell going through WrestleMania and then post WrestleMania is probably a good time frame for for us to kind of stand back and go okay so what is this really about all right brian tell people where they can find you on uh social media all the work that you do and and how i knew you originally was from your dallas maverick stuff yeah (laughs) funny uh well garrett i don't know if you remember because remember we actually first interacted for uh viva the locker room green room app way back when yes no no a hundred percent (laughs) <laughs> that's what I that's what I remember you from, but I th- only knew of you as a Dallas Mavericks guy, yeah, more so than the wrestling thing back then. Right, for sure. Um, but yes, uh I write weekly uh hits and misses for BW Torch, uh some casual editorials I might throw up there every now and again. Um, but I'm available at Brian Zone along with my basketball stuff. So I am a contributor to MavsMoneyball.com. Uh, I'm actually going and doing some coverage uh, later this evening for the G League team that hopefully I'll have some good stuff up uh, later. And then I do have the Money in the Bank Shot podcast that I'm trying to get back in rhythm now, which Garrett, I'm, I'm starting to understand your struggles of trying to balance out <laughs> so much stuff at some times. It's like, Jesus, uh, because well, I, that, that I is like a wrestling and hoops podcast, right? Yes. Money in the Bank Shot. So, um, okay. That's, it's I mean, good that's, stuff, that's but, unique. That's different. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, but I did, I, what did I do? I did SmackDown this morning and wrote the review. I did actually a stream with uh, PW Torch before jumping on this. And I've got probably content to chop up later. So I, I'm just like, oh man, this is what everybody, cause you're doing this, you're doing the warrior stuff. You're doing the giant yeah. stuff, probably some Niner stuff mixed in there. You're doing fight game media. So like, I can't, that obviously thank you enough for this opportunity and put you over for what you're doing. Cause uh, you, like you and everybody at fact fight game and observer are killing it. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. And you're going to come back with me when uh, the warriors play the Mavericks and, and we'll, we'll talk, yes. you know, Western conference uh, final uh, from last year. And, and so that there's some interesting stuff going on with both teams right now. So, all right. So I want to thank Paul Fontaine for jumping on with us want to thank brian for for jumping on as well uh i'm double g john larock and i will be back wednesday night on the fight game podcast the audio version because uh john can't really do video his his wi-fi isn't fantastic enough he would have if john was on here he would have disappeared like the elite uh in, 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 their, <laughs> in their commercials like four or five different times that i had the key yeah don't worry john's coming back but uh well but thank you john i will be back so uh see you when we see you peace out